welcome to Working Preacher Books Podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. Along with Bandit the Podcat, as we gain insights and hear stories straight from Working Preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we will talk with Lisa Crespin, who is the author of The Gospel People Don't Want to Hear. There is Rolf holding it up in the Working Preacher Books series. So glad that you're here with us, Lisa. Uh, welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast. This is the second of our podcast. So uh... yeah, thank you. I am really, really delighted to be here. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So I am an Episcopal priest, Uh, go back um, a really long time now, and I am the founding steward of Backstory Preaching, and Backstory Preaching is an all-online ministry, ecumenical, for preachers, and one of the short ways to think of what we do is wherever formation in homiletics leaves off in seminary, we pick up. So one of the ways I like to think of my role is if those of you who are the preaching professors in seminaries are sort of like the physicians of the preaching world. I'm like the home health nurse practitioner. That's great. (laughs) And what I loved, what gets me out of bed in the morning is trying to figure out the real practical problems preachers face in their context and solve those so that they are able to proclaim the word with joy and gratitude and curiosity and in a way that affects their entire ministries. So we focus on the process, how sermons are getting done and is it sustainable, craft, skill development and their spirituality, their relationship with God. So I am sorry to tell all the preachers out there but I have the best ministry gig on the planet (laughs) Because all I do is work with preachers and good news. It's the best and it's mine. That's fantastic, Lisa. And yeah, you are just touching so many uh, preachers out there. It's such great ministry. And what what that uh, backstory preaching is about is really uh, the uh, partly the focus of, of this book right. uh, with working preacher books because you are you are touching on a really practical issue of what does it what does it mean to preach challenging messages and and the first chapter really gets at the heart of it where you talk about uh, the preachers need to let the sky fall uh, with regard to their listeners. So, um, say a little bit more about that, because I think, you know, that's your, that's your primary metaphor for the book and so critical for, uh, for what you are suggesting to preachers. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So the metaphor comes of course, from chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And this book was written before COVID. It was published just as the pandemic was really hitting across the United States and North America. And so it was more prescient than I realized. But the same concerns pre-COVID are going to be there post-COVID, which is that the life that most of us have known and the privileged have enjoyed is falling apart. Between global migration, the advances of technology uh, to uh, systemic changes that are happening in all of the ways that we function together as a society and of course climate change that is affecting daily lives in in a manner that is faster than any other time before in history and so many concurrent changes that are affecting people worldwide none of it is localized so the world as we have known it is changing and it's not going back So the pieces, what I talk about with the sky is falling is we have things we value and appropriately so, relationships, our livelihood, uh, um, our identity. There are many things that we value that we are not yet willing to let go of, but they are being affected regardless because of these global changes. So, so much of the distress I see happening in the world around us 
can be identified as symptoms of grief, anger, circling the wagons, sadness, depression, uh, not knowing, uh, not being able to say, this is the, the way I thought life was going to turn out. I don't recognize my church. I don't recognize my country. All of those are symptoms of grief mm -hmm. in a world that is changing. So a lot of our energy is being put, uh, put into holding up pieces of the sky mm -hmm. that we think, we believe we can't let go of that are going to be the absolute end of us if we let them go. And what I'm suggesting is the way through this is to say, yes, it's changing and it's really hard. It's extremely painful. And we have to let those things go in order to live a life of genuine resurrection. Yeah, I, I thank you for that, Lisa. I think that image of, of holding up pieces, right, of the sky, uh, so that it doesn't fall down uh, on top of us. And I think about too, like one of the things I really appreciated about this book is that, you know, that invitation to let the, those pieces of the sky fall in part because I had the image of how much energy it takes to hold those pieces up. Exactly. And then what happens if we let those go and, and then where does that energy get directed? And right. I think what I hear you saying in the book is then it gets directed to, uh, which is another question I had, it gets, it, it gets directed to a, a wider purpose of why we do what we do and why the church does what we do. Because one of the things, and let me and see if I'm, I'm right with this. And uh, if I'm, if I'm uh, reading you uh, correctly, like, because one of the things I think when people see this book or hear this book, they'll think, oh, this is going to help me preach the issues, right? This is going to help me, you know, and it does, but in a really different way, because you, you, you channel it toward this wider purpose that this is not issue preaching, uh, but is, uh, but how is it that once we, once we uh, let go of that, those falling pieces and move that energy toward, you know, the, 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 the wider perspective, uh, what difference could that make? Is that, is that right? Right. Yeah. Because the, what I'm suggesting is that what constitutes a challenging message, a challenging sermon is not because of the issue of the day. It is not because of politics. It is because somebody is feeling threatened that something they hold dear, some piece of their sky, they might have to let go of it. Mm -hmm. And so they hear something in the sermon that makes them feel scared that something that matters to me, I'm being asked to give up for the sake of the gospel. So the, the issues of the day are, are symptoms of what is happening in our hearts and souls. So if sermons get at what's at the heart and soul, it therefore by its own accord will address the issues of the day. But if we don't address those deeper uh, heart soul issues, then we're kind of stuck. Yeah. Yeah. I, it reminds me of my therapist used to say, um, and, and she wasn't the first to say it, obviously, the issue is rarely the issue. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. So if we take any given issue of the day and start asking what, what is at stake for people? What are they afraid to lose? What do they believe they cannot live without? which is really another form of saying, I really believe that death is the end and there can't be resurrection. Mm -hmm. So for example, if we have a, a small congregation that is being affected by the demographics and a, uh, a, a church is in decline by numbers, the nostalgia that comes up, oh, if only, if mm -hmm. only we had more children, if only we had more youth, that that would solve the problem not likely. What's happening is I'm, I'm afraid of this congregation that has meant so much to me for so many decades has given me the word of God. I'm going to lose all of that. 
I'm going to lose my relationships with these people I love. I'm going to lose understanding who I am in relationship to God if this congregation closes. Yeah, yeah. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. God still finds a way. I found that discussion. Um, that's that's chapter one, letting the sky fall. And uh, uh, for those who uh, might listen and buy the book, which we hope you will, it's uh, uh, you say that on on thirteen, it's page thirteen, that a challenge of sermon is determined by the relationship the listener has to their sky. Mm -hmm. But what if, what if, it, and of course, the bigger the congregation, the more people have different pieces of sky, so it becomes impossible to track. Um, but but what if? So uh, uh, Carolyn and I had a teacher who, uh, uh, a homiletics, our homiletics teacher, whose uh, brother was killed in 1960 in a car accident. Well, he was, he was hit by a truck, actually. Uh, but, and it was really important to him that, that what, God didn't do that. That was an accident. An accident's happened in this world. And then he told in his last sermon, uh, he preached, uh, uh, telling about when he was a pastor and a young girl was killed. And it was very important to him to for him to um, tell the parents, God didn't do this. It was an accident. But then he said, but I shouldn't have done that because they said, oh, that was the only thing that was keeping us going, that there was actually a hidden purpose that we just couldn't understand. Mm. So what do we do if we accidentally, which we inevitably will, actually rip that piece of sky out of somebody's hands, but it's really what's getting, what's keeping them going? Right. That's, that's a great, that's a great question. I think what we have to do is present the gospel in such a way that it sounds invitational because any of us is free and able to accept the gospel or turn it down. So asking questions of what if, what might be, what's possible if uh, how do we reconcile a loving God with the accidents of the world? And when we do things like a lot of Jesus's parables, when we present one thing and then the other thing, and we let people come to their own conclusions about it, let them wrestle with it. People who have ears to hear will take that and run with it and ruminate and wrestle with that and come to conclusions. People who aren't ready for that will dismiss it and move on because it's more than they can manage in that moment. Maybe down the road, it'll come back. But presenting, showing, here's one thing, here's the other, you make of that what you will. Well, and, and part of it too, I think, and Lisa, I mean, you're in chapter two, you move to the, the importance of trust. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when, as Rolf is saying, like when, you know, when that sky falls, <laughs> uh, who's going to, that piece of sky falls, who's going to catch them? And, and then how critical uh, establishing trust is between you and the listener and, and a mutual trust. Right. Uh, right. Do you think that that's connected to what, uh, I mean, that's a critical piece, I think, to what uh, Rolf is asking as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we can't, we can't get anywhere if we don't have mutual trust. Yeah. And not only does there have to be trust built between the preacher and the listeners, but part of the preacher's job is to help people under, uh, establish more trust between them and God, because mm -hmm. there are so many things that we can't easily reconcile that if God is loving, how do accidents happen? Mm -hmm. is a common one. How can my loved one die if God really loves us all? And so in the book, I go and do some really practical things. Well, what is trust? What are components of trust? I talk about re reliability, competence, and sincerity. Mm -hmm. And that needs to go both ways, again, between listeners and preacher, and also helping foster that trust in God's reliability, God's competence, God's sincerity so I that that the, triangle happens. Yeah, I thought that was an incredibly helpful point, which is um, that, I don't, I don't think you use this metaphor, but really there, I mean, there's a triangle. It's a lot of times I talk to my students about, you have to build trust before you can uh, lead change of any kind, mm -hmm. uh, unless you just want to chase 
um, 20% of the, of the congregation away. I mean, if you come in blazing uh, from whatever ideological perspective you're coming into, uh, so you have to build trust, mm -hmm. but there's also, um, I mean, which takes time. I mean, it takes, mm -hmm. it takes being by deathbeds and an empty grave or, or not empty graves, but uh, by the laying the casket in the ground by, by, by a full grave. And it, it, it takes the, that to build trust in yourself. But more importantly then is the, the other end of the triangle is fostering growing trust in God. I thought that was really helpful. Right, right. Yeah, because we have so much evidence that it seems like God is not reliable. God doesn't show up on cue mm -hmm. or God is not competent. God doesn't, can't actually make things happen the way I think they're, they're supposed to happen. Or God isn't sincere when God says, I love you, but I have no evidence of love in my life. How can that work? Does God really mean what God says? And that's where so many people get into a crisis of faith is because they are having a misunderstanding of what trust actually means. Mm -hmm. So in what ways is God worthy, worthy of our trust? Mm -hmm. And to be able to show how that works through scripture in the ways that God is worth our trust. You know, one of the things that's so important, and one of the things too that I uh, really appreciated about your book, Lisa, is that you help me think too about what you're what you're presenting and what you're arguing for uh, is a, a kind of getting to know your congregation. Mm -hmm. which we all have to do as preachers, right? That's the, that's the contextual, as, one of the aspects of preaching that is so important is that context, into what context are you preaching? Mm -hmm. and, and then we also recognize as preachers that we're not, we don't preach just to one congregation, we have many congregations within the congregation, you know, pockets. And so getting to know your congregation partly to build trust, but so that you know what they need to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, but you help me think about it in a really different way, because it's not just, I think what you're suggesting, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about this, it's not, it's not just listening to kind of those, uh, those sort of contextual demographic kinds of details, which are important, mm -hmm. but you are really suggesting a kind of deep listening or uh, an, 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 an attention to um, some the deeper issues or the, mm -hmm. the deeper questions that are theological. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, is that, am I getting at that? Do you yeah. think? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because we need to, we need to understand who do people see themselves to be mm -hmm. in relation to the things and people that matter to them. Because anytime there is a change in life, it means something is being lost. And then there's this transition and then something else will replace it. Yeah. And so anytime there's a change, it means I don't understand who I am at the moment in relation to the loss or the other person or whatever is happening around. And so when we are getting to know our congregations, it's getting to know what really matters to you. Mm -hmm. how, how, who do you understand yourself to be? And in particular, how do you identify and define yourself in ways that are outside of the realm of the fundamental understanding that you are a child of God? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are what are the ways you are ascribing your own identity so that they are essentially the things of this world that will pass away? Mm -hmm. So if I think I can't go on if my job industry falls apart or my party doesn't get elected or people of a different persuasion move into my neighborhood, if I can't live under those circumstances, wow, you don't have a whole lot left. But if you understand yourself fundamentally as I am a child of God, mm -hmm. that's how I define myself, not by anything else primarily. We can't not define with those other things, but primarily I am a child of God. Mm -hmm. So then it's really the gospel is available. 
it's really getting it to the question of identity and claiming that identity. And, right. Exactly. And, uh, and maybe to what extent that's not an identity we want to hold on to sometimes. <laughs> right. It, it, right. It, it, shifts, it shifts how we, it shifts the perspective and it certainly, certainly mm -hmm. shifts the perspective of, of, of uh, the sky. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's so important that we understand that sense of identity because when the gospel is asking people to do something they don't want to do, for example, welcoming the stranger, welcoming people who don't look like me, then it means we are asking them to sh also shift the relationships they have with people who are not yet ready to change. So mm -hmm. I might change and be hooked by the gospel and think, okay, I get it. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I am transfigured. I'm there. I'm, I'm with you, Jesus, but they've got to go home. And they're right. still living with people who are not living that, that reality with Jesus or they're working with people, or they're in a neighborhood of people. Right. And we right. all do this. There is, a, there is a price we pay to follow Jesus Christ and the gospel. Yeah. And that's what the gospel people don't want to hear is, yeah, you got to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to have a cake and eat it too. I know mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, I, I don't want to give up the stuff <laughs> I want. I, I like my idols. cake. <laughs> I shine them and I polish them and I tuck them into bed and I hold them right. close. I love my idols. I don't want to yeah. give them up. Yeah. They're so shiny and wonderful. They're so shiny. I've worked <laughs> so hard at that too. But exactly. that's the price. I, I found uh, you, you use you have a few sets of lists in the book that I found were really helpful um, for uh, folks to check in. I, I want to talk to you about a couple of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you have a set of lists in the building mutual trust uh, mm -hmm. chapter, chapter two, um, you know, really basically uh, defining uh, trust as faith, hope, and love, mm -hmm. and then using, using our words around those uh, to, to talk about, you know, you can take an inventory and, and figure out where the trust is. Um, I, don't, I, I would point people to a book called The Trust Edge by David Horsager, secular, PhD from the University of Minnesota, who's, who works with businesses to say that the only thing you have that matters is, is your customer's trust. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you lose that, but uh, I think that's really true, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is, um, the, the, uh, a preacher comes with a certain amount of trust, especially if they are hired by, you know, from the, a trusted seminary or come from a, you know, a system and they operate in certain ways. Oh, they sing in the liturgy. I'm familiar, right? So you come with that stuff. I see in, its, I see in this era of social media, I see so many preachers doing things on social media, uh, which they have no idea is destroying the trust. Mm. Um, so how, I mean, so I just want you to think, because I, I don't think you had talked in, in those in that list just about the danger of social media, you know, that you can accidentally in a moment of anger uh, show what you really think about something or uh, or, you know, social media blur is private and public. So you take a private sentiment and you make it public. You're a public person and and people will. Uh, that don't go to that church will assume, well, everybody that goes to that church must think that because that preacher does. So, so what does social media do to this whole problem of building trust? Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. Well, it's like a whole podcast. I got 25 oh, it minutes. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't even put an, an ichthus symbol on my car um, because I'm afraid of them. People are associating. If I make a mistake on the road, well, there goes another Christian who, what do you expect? Yeah, what, whatever we put out there is out there forever. And so, yeah, we have to be extremely, extremely cautious because I remember there was a, um, a famous basketball player a couple of decades ago whose behavior was not particularly exemplary. And some journalists said, well, don't you realize you're a, you're a role model? I mean, what you're doing is affecting kids. And he's like, dude, they're not paying me to be a role model. They're paying me to get balls in a hoop. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care. I quote Charles Barkley all the time in my books. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the same thing as whether we like it or not, 
there, there is no blurring between whom we represent, who we are as people, and, and what we are doing. I, in um, my first book, Backstory Preaching, Integrating Life, Spirituality, and Craft, one of the big premises of that book that I talk about is preaching is your life, your life is preaching. And not that we are in the pulpit talking all the time, but it's, it's the same premise of, for those of us who are parents, we are always teaching our children something, mm -hmm. always. The only question is, what are we teaching them in any given moment through our speech, our decisions, our actions, our body language? We're always teaching. We as preachers are always preaching. Mm -hmm. There is not a moment we go through of any day we are not preaching our belief about the gospel. The only question is, what are we preaching? Mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not, that's the role we stepped into. So social media, no matter what we're putting up there, we are preaching some aspect of what we believe the gospel is. Yeah. So we want to try to make that to be as absolutely congruent as possible uh, and beg forgiveness when we mess up. Yeah, that yeah, can, oh, that, go ahead, Rolf. No, go ahead, Carolyn. No, that congruency, that, that I think that's a key word here. And that's really one of the, uh, I, I want our listeners to hear that that's one of the aspects about this book that is so important for preachers is, is, a, is an opportunity to reflect on uh, and discern the importance of con congruity yeah. <laughs> and, right. uh, and integration. Mm -hmm. of who you are and uh, and who they who your listeners are who your congregation are who they truly are and and then and then how does that get um, how does that get reflected in in what we do and then for us particularly what we say mm -hmm. so I just I wanted to highlight that Rolf did you have another well the only thing I was going to just going to talk about a, a different set a different set of uh, lists in uh, the bully pulpit um, chapter but having said that I, I should at least uh, give you a chance to um you def uh, you help people i had never thought about bully pulpit as a pulpit in which somebody bullies which is but you were pointing out that a lot of people hear it that way today mm -hmm. and there is an original meaning of the phrase um so teddy roosevelt says that the uh, bully pulpit is when you've got the megaphone and people are listening and that's what we have a rare opportunity to do in our world is have people's undivided attention for a few minutes to say something that really matters. And so we want to use that megaphone with integrity and care. Yeah, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't known that the word bully meant like awesome, tremendous, fantastic uh, uh, a century ago. So that was helpful. Right. Yeah, bully for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but then you have a set of lists there and you kind of say you can take the anxiety temperature uh, of, uh, to figure out, um, as I was looking through that list, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, all sorts of different things uh, that might get people anxious. Um, some of them political, some of them theological, some of them sociological. Um, and what makes, what makes it for me even more is, so you got a list of 30 things and I could add another 30. And one, one thing on that list might be one person's trigger issue. Mm -hmm. So that even if you put a one next to that for the rest of the congregation, it might be one family's thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so how does that make, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that make leadership even more complicated? Oh, the fact yeah. that people have trigger issues. Right, because we're not, um, we are not dealing with um, monolithic whole. We're dealing with a collection of individuals and families, all of whom have their own histories and their pieces of the sky they don't want to let go. So when we say something that turns out to be a trigger issue, and I'm sure we've all had that in after we have preached something and we get a parishioner who says, well, you said X, Y, or Z, and they're very upset, and we never said it, or even if we do say it, then the next question is trying to get at what really matters. What, what frightened you in that? What was at risk? What of your identity, your livelihood, your relationships, your relationship with God, something is under 
that trigger. So what are you really afraid of? Mm-hmm. And how might God address that to say, do not be afraid? Mm-hmm. It- you know, uh, one of the things that our listeners uh, I like to hear, or we think they like to hear, uh, is is yes about about your book, and that's why you're here. Uh, but I also know that they want to hear. So I'm going to shift a little bit. They want to hear Lisa, like who you are as a preacher. Uh, that's one of the what's one of the great things about this series is getting these preachers to write these books, and then to hear, and then the podcast to hear. Yeah, what 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 motivates you? What inspires you? So, the you know one of the questions I had for you on a personal level, Lisa, is that the kind of work that you're asking or you're suggesting we need to do as preachers of this deep listening and really getting at you know these underneath issues of what we're holding up, right? I uh, is and you talk at the end of the book about uh, self compassion. Mm-hmm. How I mean, how do you do this kind of work without self compassion? Right. And so I'm I I'd love for our listeners to hear what it, what do you do uh, for to to be compassionate to yourself? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and particularly, you know, that you need to do that too because you're walking alongside preachers. And so uh, yeah, what do you do to be compassionate to? To Lisa. Well, I think one of the, the, the biggest learnings I have had since starting Backstory Preaching, and I say this as an Enneagram one, which is go ones. go ones, we rock. Uh, so ones have a, a particularly difficult time with making mistakes. And oh, wait, what? What? <laughs> so I mentioned at the beginning that I started backstory preaching in 2016. And for any of you who are listening, haven't seen a picture. So I am solidly middle-aged. And so for God to put this on my heart, to start this ministry in middle age for an all online, all online ministry, God and I are going to have a bit of a conversation about that when, yeah, when it's my, we're going to have a bit of a conversation about that. Um, But the mistakes I have made are of infinite variety and shapes and sizes. And I had to learn early on really fast that if I let those mistakes really get to me and be a reflection of my identity, who am I in relationship to God? If I make these mistakes, who am I in relation to uh, the preachers I'm trying to serve? If I really let those get to me, I will cease to function. I will have to give up the ministry. I won't be able to do anything. So one of, one of the biggest blessings for backstory preaching for me is learning that self-compassion to hold my mistakes far more lightly than I used to. Mm. I do my best to clean up the mess and I move on mm. because I know tomorrow's going to bring another whole new set of mistakes all I can do is learn and grow from them and do my best. And I'm also um, far more empathetic and patient when other people are also making mistakes. We laugh a lot at backstory preaching when stuff happens, because what else are you going to do? Mm. This isn't life or death. It's all good. So exercising a lot of self-empathy for, yeah, human. Oh, well. That's a great truth for our listeners to hear. Thanks, Lisa. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, talk about one of the hardest sermons you ever had to preach. You know, the hardest ones are when I can't find the one thing I'm trying to say, and I'm trying to shoehorn in a message or an idea, and so it doesn't feel authentic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like something I really believe, and that's what stresses me out. Mm -hmm. I That is... Um, because that sense of integrity of, I believe what I am saying, I believe this is good news. And when I can't quite figure out what is that thing, nah, that's, yeah, that's, I lose sleep over that. Hmm. How do you get unstuck from that? Or do you not? I mean, does it, yeah. Yeah, How do you uh, unstick yourself? I go back to the text. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The text, the text, the text, the text. 
Um, and I've got a few people I can talk things over with to help me sort through what am I trying to say. And um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, that's a lot of what we do at Backstory Preaching and the, the, this, it happens far less often than it used to because of the process I developed to help preachers get to what is the one clear message I am trying to say. And so when I use the process, it really, um, it doesn't happen nearly as often, but that is the thing that gets me. Is there a book, uh, is there a book of the Bible that you've always wanted to preach on, but you've never preached on? Oh, good question, Rolf. That is a really good question. Probably Proverbs. Mm. Because they're so, they're so pithy. Um, and there is a lot you can do to, to figure out what is the backstory behind the proverb. Uh, mm. That would be a lot of fun. And I, uh, one, one of my, my absolute favorite thing to do in preaching is to write a story so that the entire sermon is a story. Mm. And so to think of the, the stories that could be crafted about a proverb, mm. that would be really fun. Other than the high priestly prayer in John, is there a passage you hate preaching on? <laughs> you took the one I would have said. Oh no, my God. Seriously, no, because Caroline and I was argue about that one. So, uh, oh, that's great. Yeah, the, the um the ones when when uh, Jesus seems to have um, be really really crabby, the the crabby Jesus. Those are I find those difficult because they are incongruent with my general experience of who Jesus is. Our third uh, our, our third host on the Working Preacher. Uh, podcast has not shown himself today, but we do have some file pictures of it for those who are watching. And his name is Bandit the Podcat, and he has a he has six questions that he'd like to ask you. And All Caroline right. has the first one. Yeah, so Bandit, we we like these uh, questions that Bandit has come up with, and yes. uh, and and he's ver a very insightful feline, that's for sure. So Bandit asks, wants to know. What is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? <laughs> so I have a cat. You do? I do, named Fiona. Aww. And I love Fiona very much. And the reason why uh, Fiona and I love cats the most is because they teach me every day why dogs are better. <laughs> <laughs> Banda would like to know, uh, what is your favorite bird? Mockingbird. They, 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 seriously, they, they perch on my chimney and they sing on the top of my chimney and the, and the song comes down through my chimney and out to the house. We had it literally a 10 minute solo this morning, 10, 10 minutes of mockingbird song in my house this morning. Amazing. Oh, that's awesome. So, and Bandit also wonders, I don't know if Bandit himself has ever played an instrument, but he is wondering did you ever play an instrument in your, several. in your, really? I, I, I play several instruments and I am master of none, but I play several. Yes. So oh. um, fiddle, penny whistle, flute, bow ron, and sing. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Now I, I play the violin, but I do not play the fiddle. So yeah. as Rolf knows, he once asked me to fiddle and I'm like, no, nah, I don't fiddle. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, and that's true. That's, that's true. The, uh, I wish I had uh, learned to play both the violin and the fiddle. Um, Bandit wonders, what's the weirdest place you've ever taken a nap? Standing up. Wow. <laughs> it didn't end well. <laughs> yeah, I did twice. I have fallen asleep standing up. And uh, I hope yeah, it wasn't it, during your own sermon. W well, uh, no, fortunately not. At, it wasn't that bad. Um, but yeah, twice I have fallen asleep standing up and I was that exhausted. And yeah, it was very embarrassing when I stumbled as I woke up. And Bandit wants to know, but I actually also want to know, what, what books do you read besides the Bible uh, and working preacher books? Uh, what, what kind of books do you read? What's, like, what's, on, what's on your bedside table? Um, Well-written novels. Um, I think are, are both just wonderful and they're great for preaching short stories. 
also, um, and books on uh, nature, things that will evoke, uh, that will cultivate wonder, awe, gratitude. So books about the universe, for example, cosmology, mm. love that stuff, love mm. it. Mm. Final question from Bandit. Um, he would like to know if you think the serpent in Genesis 3 gets too much credit for the fall. Oh, way too much. Just, oh my gosh, give the poor snake a break. Oh <laughs> well, the God. snake who, wants I mean, the who credit. Who actually picked up the apple? Who actually ate it? Seriously? Exactly. Yeah, yeah well, poor snake. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of Working Preacher Books podcast. Um, stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org and follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Hey everyone, this is Lisa Cressman again. And thank you so much to uh, Caroline and Rolf. It was wonderful to be here for this conversation. And if you are curious about backstory preaching and want to apply a spiritual approach to your sermon prep, there is a free guide that you can find at faithlead.luthersem.edu. If you go to resources along the top menu bar, then scroll down and you will find Craft an Effective Sermon by Friday, the quick start guide, free download, and you can learn this uh, scaffold of Lexio Divina applied to your sermon prep, get them done on your schedule and grow closer to God in the meantime. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>